This episode of To The Journey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Hi, this is Garrett Wong. I played Ensign Harry Kim on Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. I think it's safe to say that no one on this crew has been more obsessed with getting home than I have. But... When I think about everything we've been through together, maybe it's not the destination that matters. Maybe it's the journey. And if that journey takes a little longer so we can do something we all believe in, I can't think of any place I'd rather be or any people I'd rather be with. To the journey. You're here. To the journey. 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 Hello, everybody at home, and welcome. This is To The Journey. I'm your co-host, Suzanne Williamson, and with me, as always, are... Zachary Fruling and... Kay Shaw. Well, today we're going to be discussing costumes. The best, the worst, the ones we'd really like to forget. So who wants to start us off? I thought that you'd be clamoring to start, Suzanne. I thought that you'd be gripping at your microphone, desperate to talk about Chakotay's marquee leathers. Actually... I would like to give an honorable mention to a non-outfit that Chakotay wore in Tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're starting out with a, with an honorable mention. Yes. I didn't want to, you know, make it my best of, but I still have to mention it because it was a non-costume, if you know what I mean, Chakotay's naked butt. <laughs> <laughs> For any new listeners that we've got out there, you may already have got the flavour somewhat of the show, given the fact that we've said, we're going to do an episode about costumes, and the first thing we're going to talk about is somebody being naked. Thank you, Suzanne. I could have mentioned Tuvok being naked, but I'd rather mention Chakotay being naked. And we do see Neelix in a bathtub. I'll mention Tuvok being naked then, because, you know, we're all about equal opportunities, nakedness, onto the journey. (laughs) There's actually lots of nakedness in Voyager. Seven's naked. Seven's naked, yes. Yep. They're always taking their clothes off on Voyager. I'm not sure they're always taking their clothes off, but there is a <laughs> more nakedness than you might expect. Janeway. Yes. Janeway. Yes. In the bathtub. Yep. Regularly in the bathtub. Sometimes with Q. Well, actually, she was multiple naked because it was the bathtub. We're we talking about costumes. <laughs> the bathtub. <laughs> and then when she had to change her clothes to save Kess. <laughs> yes. Yes, she was naked in Sacred Ground. Are we changing the topic to nakedness in Voyager? Yes, no, we're we are. just mentioning our favorite... <laughs> Non-costumes. That's all. Anti-costumes. Got it. Wait, is, you're saying it's like matter and antimatter when they uh, interact, they yeah, it's like costume annihilate or each non-costume. other? So cost, costumes and non-costumes annihilate each other yes. in Voyager. <laughs> exactly. That is how the universe is going to ultimately be destroyed due to the interaction of naked people and people wearing clothes. <laughs> Gives new meaning to shirts and skins. I think one of the things that stands out about Voyager in terms of costumes is just how many different kinds of costumes there are. Mm-hmm. They're always doing so many holodeck episodes and you get to see so many different alien species. There are a lot of costumes in Voyager. There are. Some really awesome ones, too. And some that I really like to forget. Like everything <laughs> from Neelix's resort program. Those hideous bathing suits. Men, yeah. women, all of the bathing suits. Just, ugh. Yeah, bad. Bad choices. Yeah, I mean, do we ever... Aside from in Deep Space Nine, I won't go into that too much, but aside from in Deep Space Nine in a particular episode I can think of, do we ever get any good swimming costumes or bathing costumes in Star Trek? We do get to see Loxana Troy in a hot tub. And she was naked. Mud she bath. was naked. <laughs> naked Loxana. No, no swimwear Yay! in that one, though. Sorry. This episode is about costumes, honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Loxana. 
She's my favorite. Loxana is awesome. I do agree. I do believe in um, in Star Trek: The Next Generation. There is an episode where a crew member gets injured in a bathing suit, and she and Doctor Crusher is treating her in sick bay. And she's wearing some sort of futuristic twenty fourth century metallic swimsuit. I think I remember that, but I don't remember which episode. Yeah, like she, like she was doing gymnastics or swan diving or something, and got hurt. Yeah. Oh, Zach, now you've made me think of Beverly and Deanna exercising. Oh, in the, the no, 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 not those awful costumes. <laughs> those were the worst. It, it's not swimsuits, but it's swimsuits. Like, you get to see all the men in Voyager and in The Next Generation running around in their little, like, nighttime boxer shorts. Yes. Yes, yes you do. Starfleet issue pants. This is a conversation we need to have. Or underwear, as we call it here in the United States. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is often entertaining. Yes. Pants Skivvies or for whatever. our American listeners, pants in British English means underwear, underpants. Which is the source of lots of amusement. It's the source of a lot of amusement, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before and after our To The Journey recording. It is. It's a source of about 50% of To The Journey now, outtakes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you know, you do get to see the women in their in their. You get to see Janeway in a nighty, and multiple you know, times. Generation, you see Doctor Crusher in her evening gown, nightgown type thing. I really like Janeway's nighty. We saw Belana in her night clothes. Mm, we do. Oh yeah, Janeway's nighty is awesome. Slinky nighty, I like it. Mm-hmm. I like the idea that she just like wears fancy nightwear, peach satin to bed. <laughs> it's like okay, just for herself, you know. Yeah, I don't have to be stuffy when I'm going to bed. <laughs> yeah, she's a modern kind of girl. I like it. She could be a captain and she can be feminine. Exactly. It's funny to imagine what the producers were thinking when thinking through these issues way back in 19. I think they probably overthought it a lot of it. And I think that's why not everything that they do with Janeway works perfectly because I think they thought about it way too hard. Yeah. But I like the fact that she gets into the slinky nighty at the end of the day kicks back Mm -hmm. and relaxes with a book or whatever i'm a fan of that makes me think i need to up my relaxation game in the evenings (laughs) what to pink satin get a slinky (laughs) nighty yes i need the pink satin upgrade yeah (laughs) do old cat ladies wear pink satin (laughs) nighty sack (laughs) that one does (laughs) crazy cat ladies yeah absolutely zachary is a crazy cat lady yes This must be pointed out. Card carrying. (laughs) I think we should probably just talk about the uniforms a little bit. Yeah, let's ease into talking about costumes. So there's a progression from Star Trek, the original series, into the uniforms we see in the next generation. And the next evolution of those is what we see at the beginning of Deep Space Nine and then in Voyager. Yeah. I actually have a theory about the Voyager uniform. What is your theory? Well, my theory is, if you look at the next gen uniforms, where the color is obviously switched onto the bottom, mm-hmm. they're a lot less subtle, generally speaking, in terms of like people's figure than the Voyager ones are. The Voyager ones, obviously, because black is very flattering, generally. Yes, it's very slimming. It's a lot more flattering. And I don't know whether or not that was a conscious decision to not, you know, <laughs> have, have Janeway on the bridge kind of... Not looking frumpy. Yeah. No, seriously, when Deep Space Nine started, they needed to hide Avery Brooks's belly. Is that the reason? I was watching what? Emissary last, just last night, and I was noticing the fact that he's got a little pot belly in Emissary. Why couldn't he have a pot Go back belly? and watch it. Well, they can, and they do. He could have just had a command wrap for when he puts a few pounds on. <laughs> Kirk had a pot belly for He could have gone full on Shatner. That's what the command wrap was for. It was for when Shatner put a few pounds on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is what was going on. I think they thought, you know, Avery Brooks would look a little better in black. Yeah, because even Kirk in the monster maroon uniform didn't hide his belly. No, not at all. No. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, obviously the uniform was already established when Voyager came along. Yeah, Voyager can't take credit for these. No, no. but I just feel like they just feel subtler to me. I think, like, in Next Gen, the women in particular in the uniforms, it's kind of all a bit in your face. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a good way. Yeah, in a good way, if that's your thing. But, you know, maybe that's not always the look that they're trying to go for. I mean, it's particularly bad in Series 1 because obviously they were in the spandex. Yes, with the zipper. (laughs) But I do think the Voyager uniforms look even more like pajamas than the Next Generation uniforms. And we do get the joke in the Next Generation with Data saying, oh, this is not sleepwear in in Time Zero. (laughs) They don't remind me of pajamas, though. It looks more like a mechanic would wear. You know, working on a car, that whole one piece thing. I was thinking it was more like a business pantsuit with with shoulder pads. So something from the Golden Girls? (laughs) 80s pantsuit. 
Can't you picture Hillary Clinton wearing one of these? No. A Starfleet uniform. I'd love to see Hillary Clinton in Starfleet uniform. I can picture Dorothy's Bornak wearing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dorothy's Bornak. So I, actually, I can kind of picture, um, what, what's her name who played Sophia, the mother? Um, uh, Estelle Getty. Estelle Getty. I can picture her playing Neelix's role in the kitchen. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> okay, so that would make um, Rue McClanahan. It'd make a lot of cheesecake. Blanche Devereaux. That would make her seven of nine. Are we recasting again? Yes. <laughs> you know, you know, Leo LaRue makes a pretty good cheesecake. Okay, so who's Betty White? It's so long since I've seen it. And I'm not very good at remembering names. Rose Nyland, Betty White, was the ditzy one. Okay. Harry? <laughs> Harry? <laughs> I was actually kind of thinking that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could see it. Out of everyone on Voyager, that's who came to mind. <laughs> Harry's a little bit like Rose in Golden Girls. Love that show. Let's see. And uh, Blanche would be Tuvok and Ponfar. Or Seven. Or Seven. <laughs> in her silver outfit being all sexy. Oh, yeah. This is costume related. This isn't a tangent. <laughs> yeah, this works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and actually, who, who's the neighbor that Blanche is always flirting uh, with? Dr. It, Harry Weston. Yeah, that, that would be Chakotay. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Mulligan is Chakotay. <laughs> Sexy neighbor. <laughs> yes. Golden Girls Voyager mashup. There you go. How many mashups can we do? That is the question. It had to happen. We should ask the listeners actually to send us in their mashups. Oh, yeah. Well, if, if you remember in... In the Golden Girls, they did eat a lot of cheesecake in the kitchen, so I can actually picture Estelle Getty slash Neelix making a Leal Root cheesecake. (laughs) And talking about, picture it, Talaxia, 1912. (laughs) (laughs) Talaxia, start eight, blah, 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 blah. Do you guys think that once Deep Space Nine switched to their sort of sleeker gray top uniforms that the the Voyager uniforms kind of looked a little cartoony by comparison when you put the two cast photos side by side? No. No, not at all. I don't think so. I mean, they are different. I really like those uniforms. I think they generally get referred to as the first contact uniforms because that's the first time they had them, wasn't Mm -hmm. it? First contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. First contact uniforms. And I think they look really, really cool. I think they're probably my favorite iteration of like the main uniforms. Mm -hmm. But I just really like the fact that then we obviously get Voyager keep the old ones because they weren't there to get the new ones. I just thought that was just a really nice touch. It was just like a nice little bit of canon that I just enjoyed the fact that that was a thing. And and even after they contacted Starfleet and were in com- communications, they still didn't change. I liked that. Yeah. I mean, they probably didn't have the energy reserves to replicate everyone new uniforms. That was probably the whole reasoning behind it. But still, to stick with it, I liked. Did they have the new uniforms when the doctor got sent to the Alpha Quadrant? No, because Andy Dick was not wearing one. Because I guess they'd have to like get a pattern for the replicator. Although otherwise somebody would have to try and program it in based on what it looks like and they'd probably get it wrong. <laughs> These legs are too short. Wearing a slightly wonky version of the Well, he, no, no, no. I, I just Googled this slash frugal this and he is in the new uniform, Andy Dick. Oh, is he? What? I probably just put Robert Picardo's uniform on him in my head, which is weird. So what was Robert Picardo wearing? <laughs> he was wearing a non-uniform. Holographic clothes don't count. <laughs> so the doctor's permanently naked then in your head? I guess so. <laughs> Never really thought about it, but yeah, I guess so. <laughs> if he's a hologram and he just projects clothes, technically there's mm-hmm. not anything under there, is there? But he made the modifications to his program, so yes, there are things under there. Now, Kay, this sounds like a question you would ask in the holographic Scottish program, not the Irish program. <laughs> <laughs> what's under that kilt? Yeah. <laughs> what's, up? what's under that holographic kilt? <laughs> photons. More photons and more photons. Photons and force fields. Perhaps we should ask Lee, <laughs> and, and he might be able to shed some light on this for us. I don't think Lee's kilt is holographic. I think it's a genuine <laughs> kilt. <laughs> I understand that. But he could give us a guide. I guess the doctor has made a tiny little addition to his program. Yes. Well, not tiny. Wasn't that from the birdcage? <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> now, now, Neelix's resort program actually kind of reminds me of the birdcage. When they're sitting at the restaurant, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they just need Nathan Lane walking by doing his John Wayne impersonation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that would have made the resort program tolerable for me. 
Yeah, <laughs> I, d- I don't really know what is quite so off-putting about the resort program because on the face of it, like a nice beach program should be really good, but it's not. Is it because it's Neelix? And we have to see Neelix's naked feet, which I really didn't want to see. Space Hobbit feet. <laughs> Yes. In terms of costumes, that's one of the things that really dates the show. Like, you get those like high waist bikini uh, bathing suits. And, mm-hmm. You know, it, it looks like it looks like it's from the nineteen nineties. Like, fashion has yeah. changed. Yeah, it has. Although I think a lot of the stuff you see in Star Trek, even though you know it's influenced by like eighties and nineties fashion, it's not stuff you'd ever expect anyone to actually wear in the eighties or nineties. Yeah, it's kind of like the worst bits of the eighties and nineties. I didn't wear that. <laughs> I didn't wear that in the 90s. Except when they go to Southern California in the late 20th century. Ah, yes. Yes. Well, that's a favorite outfit right there. That is Janeway's outfit. Yeah. Janeway's white suit. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's a nice one. That counts as part of the discussion. That's a costume. It counts. Yay. And Chakotay. It was on my list. Chakotay looks smashing in his Don (laughs) Johnson-esque. He looks smashing. That was very English of you, Oh, thank you. Smashing. <laughs> just trying it out. <laughs> How did it feel? It felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite weird, yeah. It, yeah, but I just, I hate it when they do that with his hair. I hate it when they comb his hair yeah, down over his forehead. That was a George Clooney-ish ER era. It does not suit him. It didn't do anything for him, no. They do it in the fight as well, and I just don't, I don't like it. Yeah. I really don't like it. That and it's not salt and pepper, so... Boo. No, he's dying it by this point. Grr. I mean, I know we've kind of talked about this to death in other episodes of To the Journey, but what about the Maquis outfits versus the Starfleet uniforms? We don't get to see very much of them. Did someone say Maquis leather? <laughs> Is that what <laughs> I heard? Did. Yes. I was trying to not say leather because I knew it would trigger a response. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying I'm predictable? Yeah, I, I agree with that. <laughs> Easily triggered by leather is where I was going. No, just Maki leather. Chakotay's Maki leather. I think that the Maki outfits are amazing, and I think they look fabulous on everybody. Oh, yeah, Seska. Seska looked... Seska. Was one of the best. Yeah, Belana looks great. Mm-hmm. Even Tebot looks great. He looked uncomfortable to me. But then he looks uncomfortable in pretty much everything he's wearing. Well, yeah. He wants to be in his robe thingy. Yes. His Vulcan robe. He, he looks comfy in his jammies. I mean, I, I know we all like the Maquis outfits, but do you think they should have kept them, like, rather than taking the Maquis and putting them in Starfleet uniforms for the entire show, should they just continue to wear their Maquis outfits? No. No, I don't think so either. I think I agree, but I'm just throwing it out there. It would have further separated or the two different crews when they were trying to bring them together. Yeah. So they needed the uniform cohesiveness. Yeah, I wish it hadn't happened quite so quickly. I would have liked to have seen a yeah. bit more of a period of adjustment. It would be nice to see them in the leathers for a few episodes. I will concur. I guess it's kind of a strange mental picture to think of Chicote being first officer, kind of commanding the bridge in his leather. I wouldn't have had a problem with that. Okay, so maybe what I want then is not that they would have kept them for the first few episodes as the episodes stand, but I think I would have liked to have seen that period between them leaving the array and the end of Caretaker. I think I would have wanted that to be drawn out because there's a lot they could have done in there. Mm-hmm. We don't see any of the sort of... Obviously, like, Chakotay ends up in sick bay because he's broken his leg and then we have all the negotiate. We see the little bit with Tom and Jamin, which is nice, but... Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's like the whole negotiation with them, which we don't get to see. And yeah. I feel like I would have liked to see more of that. And if we'd drawn that out, then that would have naturally happened. And on another topic, why exactly do the Maquis wear leather? Like, do they have a bunch of cattle <laughs> on their planets? Like, what? Because it makes us unhappy. Why, why leather? <laughs> they needed something rough and tumble. They don't have replicators. They don't weave cloth in, on those colonies. Like, what's the problem? They have replicators, but they were using them for more important things. So they needed clothes that would last during battle. And what lasts better than leather? Don't get squinty eyed with me. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you not seeing our video, I was squinting in suspicion. A dubious he was not fashion. Not believing me. <laughs> 
No, it like, are they replicating these leather clothes? If the answer is yes, that's a little weird. Why not replicate something a little more comfortable? If the answer is no, it's like, why don't they have replicators to replicate the clothes? Do they have replicators? I don't know. Wouldn't they weave cloth versus kill all the animals to make clothes? Like, what? What's? It's kind of weird. Maybe it's vegan leather. Did you think about that? It's, ve- <laughs> it's vegan leather. <laughs> it could very well be vegan leather. Like turnip skins? Like what? <laughs> yeah, they make vegetarian leather out of stuff. I don't know what, but they Leola do. Leola root? Are those Leola root clothes? Leola root leather. <laughs> and that's why they last so well. Because Leola root stands up to anything you can throw at it. You think they could at least weave some shredded Leola root into some cloth or something? It's better than Kevlar. <laughs> Bulletproof Leola root clothing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think I've really thought about it consciously, but I think I always thought the marquee outfits were more kind of like just what they could get. Yeah, thrown together bits that they yeah. found, bartered for, stolen. Yeah. I mean, I love the look, but I do get what you're saying. It's like, why is it the, the leathers, etc.? Maybe it's supposed to be like, I don't know, phaser proof or something. <laughs> This is a little morbid, but maybe it's like the skins of the Cardassians they've killed or something. Okay, wow. so now they're, um, now they're Herogen? Yeah, it's it's like Silence of the Lambs or something. I don't know. <laughs> they're displaying wow. their kills by wearing them? <laughs> Just wearing my gold Ducat jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should have a gold Ducat. How about a jaunty hat? A Ducat hat. <laughs> yes, a Ducat hat. <laughs> <laughs> Ducat hat. Everybody should have a Ducat hat. <laughs> Hashtag Ducat hat. <laughs> you totally could make leather out of Cardassians, though, so I see where you're going with that. <laughs> it just strikes me as odd that in the 24th century they're wearing leather. I still say it's vegan. Yeah. And I mean, Chakotay's vegetarian, isn't he? So mm-hmm. he, he does subscribe to the whole he only kills stuff if he has to kind of theory, doesn't he? Like Cardassians. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe it's even cooler, like, you know, if I were in the 24th century, I'd replicate myself a really cool-looking James Dean jacket or something, you know? I, d- I really, I just like them. I just like them. Like, yeah, but I, we're probably thinking about it too much. I don't think the people who made the outfits thought about it this much. I'm over the games to I just want it to make sense, darn it. Well, you should watch a different show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you want things to make sense, Voyager's not your show. That's perhaps that's sure. Chakotay whittled them, and that's where they came from. Chakotay whittled the outfit. <laughs> yeah. So his his whittling skills are so advanced that he can whittle wood into leather, into vegan leather. Yes, he is now Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> he is the Rumpelstiltskin of the Marquis. <laughs> now I'm picturing him as Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gold. Mr. Mr. Gold. Mr. <laughs> Wouldn't it be Mr. Leather at that point? <laughs> yes. <laughs> as I was thinking about costumes in Voyager, the next thing that came immediately to mind are holodeck costumes. Because there's a lot of holodeck stories oh, and there's a lot of costumes in some Voyager. Some awesome ones. We get Bride of Chaotica. We get the Irish costumes. We What else do we get? Janeway's giant hollow novel dress. Ugh. Giant ho- hollow novel I dress. Do exactly. That one. Oh, I like it. All of Janeway's holodeck outfits in The Killing Game. The white tux, oh, the yeah, black the turtleneck tux. sweater, and the black pants. Mm-hmm. I love that. The she white tux is incredible. <laughs> to be fair, every time she gets out of uniform, she looks incredible. That's true. And her hair was just perfect in that episode. And in the holodeck and Voyager, they did period pieces. They did futuristic pieces. They did 1950s sci-fi. They did all kinds of crazy stuff. The Delaney sisters yes. had some awesome, awesome uh, Captain Proton outfits. Yeah. I am partial to the Delaney sisters and their outfits. We know. <sighs> yeah. Shocking. <laughs> shocking. It's as shocking as me saying I like Chakotay and his leathers. <laughs> I guess, you know, we could really, like, get ultra granular and go you know, nit- nitpick about the costumes and what we love and what we hate. But I think what impresses me the most is the diversity of of types of costumes and types of periods and types of things they did on the holodeck. Oh, yeah. Compared to other, other Star Trek shows. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe they acquired costumes for some of it from stuff that already existed. They borrowed it from this studio over here. Yeah. I mean, I guess in the next generation, you get, you know, Barkley doing his Three Musketeers program and you get, you know, Jordy in a sweater trying to, you know, hit on someone in the holiday. Don't forget but... Dixon Hill. You get those. Yeah, awesome Dixon Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing TNG a disservice. And, there is um, Dixon Hill, which is awesome. Oh, what's the one with um, 
New New Vertiform City. Oh, oh yeah. On the Orient Express. Mm. Yeah. What's the episode called? I can't think of it. No, I can't either. That was a good episode. Yeah, I like that episode. I can't think of what it's called though. Is it Emergence? Maybe. I don't know. I wouldn't even know if you were right. I'm so bad yeah. with those episode titles. I can't remember 750 of anything, much less Star Trek titles. <laughs> I definitely don't mix up time and again with before and after. No, I've got that one sorted out now. Oh, time and again, we need to talk about those outfits. Must we? Yes. Eh. <laughs> I like them. <laughs> I just think they're so goofy color block looking things. Yeah. Yeah. They are goofy, but we all remember them. True. You're missing the point, though. You got, you got to remember what Voyager was trying to do. These, they're out in a new part of the galaxy. They're strange new worlds again. It's not predictable, like Deep Space Nine stuck on a space station. Next Generation was a little, you know, 1980s with its with its uh, Bill Cosby sweaters. And, you know, so they were trying to do something different. And, and, you know, there's only so many ways you can make a different kinds of outfits, different colors, different textures. They're still humanoids. And they still need the same basic functions. So there's this some weird planet out there that likes orange and yellow together. And that's their thing. I love it. It's not at all pleasurable. <laughs> so first episode after the pilot, and they're like, oh, we mm-hmm. need to do something like new, out there, different, Delta Quadrant. Woo. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to raid Jake Sisko's wardrobe. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. They stole Jake's outfits. <laughs> he wore a lot of day glow too, didn't he? <laughs> Jake Sisko wore possibly, I mean, like people take the mick out of Wesley's outfits, but my God, that poor boy. Oh, poor yeah. Jake. The stuff that they put him in, like the 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 tricolor jumpsuits, and I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, the jumpsuits were just awful. It's like, why? Yeah. Why are you doing that to that nice young man? Bless him, the poor boy. Now, for like alien species, that their outfits are completely different than anything we've seen before. I have to go with the um, the hierarchy species, whose name I cannot remember. The souped up pack lids. Yeah, because <laughs> they have those really funky heads, but then like, oh, the yeah. outfit they're wearing has this giant neck that comes yes. almost all the way up to their ears. But it's pretty cool, and it works for them. I think they look like humanoid versions of the robot from Lost in Space. <laughs> Danger. <laughs> Danger. <laughs> it's one of the aliens from Voyager that reminds me of Doctor Who, I think. <laughs> It is kind of Doctor Who. It looks to me like something that could be out of Doctor Who. Yeah. But yeah, they are cool. I like those. But do you like their outfits in particular? I do. It works for that that character, that species, just because it's very confining and they come across as being so confined in their lives and oh yeah, fitting in this specific art mirrors life ask that they can yeah the costumes and the clothes convey so much about a, a race mm. in star trek and yeah. what their values are and what what they're all about right the one that comes to mind is the space garbage man from um night the dude who's like oh, leaking Maylon. radiation oh, everywhere he's, he's got like dry ice hidden in his suit so he's like <laughs> fog. Yeah. i've always thought that as well <laughs> that had to be uncomfortable <laughs> Why do you look like an 80s, walking 80s disco? It's like, excuse me, could, could someone get me a hair dryer? I'm starting to freeze here. I got dry ice in my shorts. Ew. <laughs> I think they have a cream for that now. I think my, um, probably my favorite costumes, I think, out of the, out of the aliens is probably the Herogen. I just really like their look overall. That is a nice, nice costume. It's just such a strong look, and I think when they show up instantly, you're like, wow, these guys are somebody that we need to pay attention yeah. to. They're not messing around. No. So that really works for me. Especially when they have the full the full face mask on. Oh, yeah. That's creepy. It's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. It really is creepy. And I don't think that there are many aliens in Star Trek that really manage to quite encompass that creepiness. Even mm-hmm. when they're trying to, they don't really manage it. But I think they really do come across quite intimidating. Especially when they sort of first show up and you're not really sure what they're all about. And then the actors that they chose when you first meet them are all so super tall and just Huge, towering yeah. over everyone. It's like, oh, wow. Whoa. It's just very impactful. Yeah, definitely. I think they're probably one of the most, certainly one of the most memorable aliens from Voyager, for me anyway. And the look and the costume adds a lot to that. 
How about the Vidians? I get the sense that they would really like some Cardassian skin clothes. <laughs> I think they need more color. Yeah. Because about the only one that had, like, clothes with color was Dr. Pell. That was Pell, yeah. She was the only one that wore clothes with color. I So now I'm kind of picturing Vidians in the Dayglow orange and yellow outfits from... <laughs> that would work for them. Again. It would certainly distract <laughs> you from the fact that their faces are falling off. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it would. It would be distracting, yes. Yeah, I mean, they would do themselves a bit of a favor if they dressed a bit more flamboyantly. It would divert your attention, wouldn't it, from their patchwork faces? <laughs> Bless them, poor things. So who has a favorite outfit then? Do people have like an absolute favorite of absolutely everything? In everything in Voyager. Yeah, absolutely yes. everything. Free choice, absolute favorite. Aside from the marquee leather, Suzanne. <laughs> but no, it, was, it wasn't even going to be that. That's, Wait, that's a on. given. Hands down, Janeway in the black turtleneck and black pants from the killing game she just it's even better than bride of chaotica the or queen arachne oh costume. the arachne just, costume yeah yeah just something about the black sweater and black pants it's just classic yeah black is the new black <laughs> exactly zach oh man you're gonna i don't know a favorite it's gotta be something with the why is this so hard <laughs> no, no, we only see them a couple times. No, no, no. Why don't you just paint phaser target on my back while you're at it? <laughs> okay. Like when we were talking about the idea for this show and when we said we want to talk about costumes, aside from the uniforms, what was the next first thing that came into your head? Well, I, again, these aren't really my favorites, but these are the ones that come to mind. And we talked about some of them already. I mean, you just get some very memorable images in Voyager. Mm -hmm. Outlandish stuff you don't get in the other Star Trek series. Yeah. Um, I, I like seeing... You know, Tom Paris in a Hawaiian shirt in Neelix's resort program. You don't see yes. that in the other Star Trek show. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, you get you get you get to see characters hanging out in t shirts. You get to see them in their underwear. You get to see them dressed up in twentieth century clothes. You get to see them doing all kinds of stuff you don't see much in other Star Trek series. Yeah. So it's not really one thing. Well, you it's get just to see them in their underwear more in Enterprise, but <laughs> 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 That's a special thing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess that's one of the things I liked about Enterprise, too, honestly. I like seeing Captain Archer in a baseball cap. I thought that was really relatable and interesting. And and we get, and I think Voyager started that trend, right? Defuturizing what we're seeing in Star Trek. Yeah. So uh, do I have a favorite? No, but the Arachnia costume comes to mind. I like Janeway walking around in the white jacket in Future's mm -hmm. End. So it's not really one thing. It's just that there's an overall gestalt of the Voyager imagery. And, you know, what weave all these together and you get something uniquely Voyager that only Voyager could do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I do have an absolute favorite, though, which is my I love and we haven't mentioned yet. Please give a better answer than mine. Which is the uniforms from Drive. Oh, I absolutely love those uniforms. I'm obsessed with them. I don't know why. Life. I don't like them. Wait, wait, wait. You mean the Starfleet uniforms slash racing outfits slash mm -hmm. yeah. like the, Mater the, D? The one where they've got the, <laughs> um, the gray and the white, the big white panel. And then it was the just little red bit. too yeah, yeah. much white. I love it. I just think it's it's just great. I mean, I'm a really big fan of the un uniforms in general, but I just, I love that. I actually tried to Photoshop Janeway and Chakotay's heads onto them. <laughs> Did you? I didn't manage to get it. It didn't work. Oh. Balana's hair ruined everything. I don't play a lot of Star Trek Online, but when I did play Star Trek Online, I actually created a character that was like a, a Vulcan that had the white outfit on because I thought the white outfit was cool. Mm. There are some very cool uniforms in Star Trek Online, actually. Very cool. And you can sort of create your own and mix and match them a bit, but the uniforms in there are really cool. That was the most fun part of the entire game for me. I can't even explain to you why I like them so much, but I just think they look really, really cool. Do you also like white tuxedos and that kind of thing? Like, oh, yeah. Just... I mean, I think Janeway looks great in The Killing Game. She does. That tuxedo is incredible. Anytime Janeway gets in a suit. <laughs> yeah. One uniform throughout this series that I just didn't like, didn't agree with, was the 29th century. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. It's like, yeah. really, why, yeah. is, why is one sleeve a different color? That's just weird. Why do they fit? So badly. <laughs> they look like, I don't know. They look like they've just been kind of made out of plastic bags or something. They're just, that's how bad the fit is. It's yeah, the day glow would have been better. <laughs> it would have. So incredibly unflattering. I mean, like, if you look yeah. at Barkley, like, it just doesn't fit him at all. It's just like baggy in all the wrong places. and Like the costume maker in me just rage. <laughs> just they're, they're awful. They are absolutely awful. 
And they look awful when they have them in Deep Space Nine as well. Because they have them in the f- one of the future episodes in Deep Space Nine, don't they? In Bashir. <sighs> and he and he looks awful in it as well. They, they're yeah, for horrible. him to look awful in something, you know the uniform. It's is awful. Wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that man can make a plastic bag look good. Those uniforms were number one on my list of things I hate the most in costumes. Yeah, I would like to forget them <laughs> completely. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's an interesting question whether cultural evolution is like linear, like it's heading towards a trajectory. Are we on this trend towards becoming something like what we see in the Federation? You could ask the same thing about fashion. Is fashion on a trajectory towards future fashion? Like, is can we predict where where fashion will go in the future? Is it so? Not there. You know, is it so subject to chance that we will, you know, will it be like what we see in like Back to the Future 2 with all the crazy, you know, the, with the shoes that auto lace and the, the jacket that drives itself and the two ties? You know, is that what the well, Federation the, outfits are going to be like in 100 years? Those exist now. You can get those Self-lacing shoes. Starfleet yes. boots? I think the real question you're asking is whether that's what most people will wear or whether that's what, when we get to that time, geeks will wear to be ironic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the latter will probably be true. Definitely. I would totally do that. I mean, if I went to the 24th century tomorrow, I'd be raiding Jake's wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be Somebody right in there. stole my clothes. I'd be like, seriously, dude, where's the knitting needles? I need to get myself a Wesley jumper. I do think there's something timeless about the uniforms that we see in Star Trek. I mean, even in the original series, which are a little, a little ridiculous, they look a little bit like pajamas. They, you know, they've got the bright colors because RCA was trying to show off the color television. I get it. But there's something timeless Mm. about it. Just people are going to need to be comfortable. They're going to need to Mm -hmm. be practical, do get their job done. They need to be there. There are going to be different ranks and classifications and you know different functions that need to be distinguished. And, you know, the Star Trek uniforms are timeless in that sense, right? They serve their function remarkably well. And I think that's why we can still look back at the original series and think, wow, these uniforms, okay, they're, yes, they're 1960s, but they're, they are amazingly practical. They're amazingly comfortable. They're, they're functional. Same thing with what we see in the next generation. Same thing with Voyager. They look a mm-hmm. little dated, but they're still remarkably practical and, and f- futuristic. Even Enterprise was practical with their mm. coverall type uniform. Yeah. With, with lots of pockets. Yeah, yeah. you got to have the patches. Utility. Pockets everywhere. <laughs> pockets. But Lana had a pocket. Because <laughs> with Enterprise, what I see as somebody that kind of does a lot of costume making is them trying to bridge the gap between what a NASA uniform looks like now and, 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 and a Star Trek uniform. That's what they've tried to yeah. do. And I, and, and I think it works really well. I really like what they've done with that. And it does... Very but is, is Voyager the next evolution of that? Like from that to the original series to, you know, the Voyager slash Deep Space Nine uniform, is that a natural evolution or are they too impractical because there's not enough pockets? Well, I was going to say somewhere between Enterprise and the original series, they decided that pockets were no longer required. The pockets were bad. <laughs> pockets are bad, okay? <laughs> Milana has a pocket protector for her trike doesn't she? She has a little little tools in there. And <laughs> but Dr. Crusher also had it. She also had a pocket in her little um, blue coat. Absolutely. I, I didn't really notice, but now I'm going to go back and rewatch. Do the Maquis outfits have pockets? Probably. Now I'm looking at my figures to see. Ooh, if you guys don't know the answer. That's because I was distracted by the leather. I was, you know, looking for pockets. I was going to say, when somebody comes at you in an outfit like that, you're not like, oh, can I check if you have pockets? Do you have pockets? Do you have pockets? <laughs> I think we probably ought to mention Seven's outfit a little bit. I wasn't sure whether we should. It's a stereotype. It's mm. a Voyager stereotype. Well, we can't really have a Voyager outfits conversation without talking about it at least a bit. But I just don't like it. We haven't really talked about Neelix's. No, that's true. Oh, my goodness. How did we miss Neelix's? I was trying not to. We blocked it out. He's got the best <laughs> patterns. They're hideous. Every single Neelix outfit is hideous. If I had a casino, I would do it in Neelix's shirts. That would be the the carpet pattern. The carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would ever look at that carpet. One thing I do have to say, though, because we all know about the hideousness of Neelix's outfits, but don't you guys see like some similarities between Neelix's outfits and Quark's outfits? separated at birth yeah perhaps. absolutely you know i have a, i do have a favorite item in all of voyager ready you know what it is neelix's apron <laughs> not his shower the, the cap really bright hat. splotchy multicolor with the chef's hat and everything shower yeah cap oh, chef's hat. not not the chef's that is hat. okay no no the, the, those multicolor splotchy bright color aprons th- that's my favorite 
costume item in all of Voyager. There you go. Zachary, you're just wrong. We'll get you help. No, <laughs> actually, if you can find one of those aprons, that's what I want. I want one of those. Same fabric and everything. You want one of those. Are you serious? Because that could be arranged. Yeah, I want it. Okay. But no no cheap knockoffs. I want like the real deal. We'll see what we can do. Mm-hmm. If, if anyone gets me one of those, I will take a picture of myself. I'll take a video of myself making something in my kitchen wearing that. No, so you have to you podcast in that. Leola Root cheesecake. It's a deal. It's a deal. That's what you will be making. I will make it Leola Root or some earthly equivalent cheesecake. It's ginger. That's the earthly equivalent of Leola Root. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that a looks the most cheesecake. like it, like raw root ginger. No, do you, do you guys not like those? I mean, they're ugly, they're hideous, but they're alien and they're awesome looking because they're colorful and fun and interesting. No, I don't like his outfits. Really? Yeah. I think they work for Neelix. They're as annoying as he is. They were a little crazy at the beginning. They toned them down a little bit mm. over the seasons. I don't really think they're any worse than a lot of outfits we see in Trek, to be honest. I think there are a lot of alien races in Trek that wear quite wacky outfits. Especially the original series. Yeah, I don't see them being significantly worse. You don't want some Neelix apron draperies? No? No, thanks. No. Okay. Thanks. Well, there there goes your Christmas presents. Darn it. Draperies, I would like, though, are that shiny blue material that they love in Trek. It's obviously, at some point, Paramount bought a massive, massive pile of this material. <laughs> because Wait, which, which stuff? Well, I'm just about to tell you some of the times that they use it over and over again. Okay, okay. Because I'm pretty sure it's the material that they use for the Parisi Squares outfits that we see in Next Gen. It's just like this like shiny mm-hmm. blue morph suit material. <laughs> <laughs> but it pops up several times in Voyager. We see it in the episode Remember. Balana gets a nice shiny blue outfit. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yep, I'm following you. And then in Extreme Risk, when Balana's having her doing lots of dangerous stuff on the holodeck, again with the shiny blue outfits. Yeah, they must have had bolts and bolts of that stuff. They did. And then in Workforce, it gets revived yet again. <sighs> shiny blue outfit. Ill, ill-fitting. Ill-fitting <laughs> shiny blue outfit. Somehow she still manages to look good in it, though. Oh, no. So is that your answer? If there were one fabric you could take with you, that's the fabric you would take with you? Like, for me, I would either take Neelix's apron or I would take, like, those metallic pillowcases that you get in Star Trek The Next Generation. Like, the sheets, you know, the blankets? Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they look like they're metal, but they're blankets. that look like they've got, like, metal woven into them. So they'd they'd be scratchy. Yes, those. They don't look comfortable. I like the idea that in the 24th century they have comfortable metal sheets, but, you know. Well chain mail or something. It's interesting actually because I think they do that now and I think it's like a anti bacterial thing. So maybe that's the theory in the future, I don't know. Like little soft metal chain mail sheets? Like antibacterial chain mail? Antibacterial chain mail. I don't think it feels like metal. I think like it's really, really thin metal thread. Like it's and mm-hmm. and it's woven into the sheet that makes it look metallic but it still feels like material. But too much antibacterial stuff isn't good for you. Well, in the 24th century, they probably don't have bacteria anywhere, do they? They probably have, like, Uber Flash or something, whatever Americans have instead of Flash. Like, you're, you think the whole ship is sterilized? Like, there's no bacteria anywhere on Voyager? Yeah. <laughs> Except in, in sick bay where the doctor's, you know, experimenting with stuff. Yeah, but, you know, you hope he keeps it in some sort of force field. <laughs> So you're saying in Voyager there are no bacteria because they have space flash or space Lysol mm-hmm. and it smells very lovely like Febreze on Voyager. It does. It smells like a pine forest or ocean depending on your choice of fragrance. But that's a bunch of chemicals <laughs> that aren't good for you either. Surely they just have some sort of cleansing filter thing. They don't ever really address this much in Star Trek, I don't think. And I don't think ever in Voyager, but do they still wear fragrance? Do they wear like cologne and perfume in the 24th century? Humans haven't evolved that much to where they don't need cologne or deodorant or perfume oh, anymore, gosh, right? gosh, I hope they wear deodorant. Oof. <laughs> I mean, I know humans are going to evolve, but I don't think they're going to evolve that way. No. No, I agree. Like when they get all duded up, like when Janeway puts her her dress on to go do Janeway air, does she dab a little perfume Chanel on? Chanel number five. Chanel number seven of nine. <laughs> Chanel number seven of nine. I love it. I forgot an outfit that I like. It would be it would be Janeway's dress that she wore to the luau. 
Oh, yes. At the Voyager holiday party, like at a Prixen party, they would someone gives Seven of Nine a bottle of Chanel Number no. Five, and Harry Kim would kind of waltz over, pretending to be smooth and cool, and go, "Probably should have given her Chanel Number no. Seven of Nine." <laughs> Trying to be funny, and oh, it totally Harry. wouldn't work. How many Harry, Chanel's? Harry. I don't even know how many Chanel's there are anyway. That is beyond my knowledge. I don't know, but at that point, they should be up to Chanel number forty-seven. They should be. I hope there's nine. Maybe you should write to Chanel, Zachary, and tell them. Yeah, I do really like that dress she wears at the Luau. Another dress of Jamie's I really like is the one she wears in Resistance. Oh yeah, the green uh-huh. one, and she has the oh, long yeah, yeah. hair. Yeah, that's She looks nice. awesome in that episode. That is very nice. Oh, the only other one I wanted to mention, actually, was um, I wanted to ask you guys what you think about the outfit we see Tom in at the beginning of Caretaker. Is this prison, prison outfit? outfit? Yeah. Oh, it yeah. makes me kind of sad. Well, okay, no, this is, this is interesting. Like, what would 24th century prison wear be like? Cute, apparently. It would be, it would be, cute. <laughs> it would be adorbs. It worked on him. I don't know. They made him look all a bit like I'm not sure boy band. It was very yeah boy band. His hair looks blonder. I don't know whether it's, it's because he's outside. Too. Yeah, because they're outdoors. His hair just looks blonder. It, I think than it does uh, uh, later on. Here in our real world, prison wear is designed to segregate people from society. Right? It's a type of public shaming. You don't get to wear normal clothes. You have to wear your ugly orange or gray jumpsuit right would the 24th century would their prison wear have that kind of shaming you know badge of disapproval component to it well i mean it's still a gray jumpsuit isn't it it's still a gray but jumpsuit it does seem mm-hmm. to be somewhat more flattering but it's a backstreet boy one <laughs> it is backstreet boy back all right <laughs> lieutenant paris is back all right oh wow everybody how yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if we can learn anything else about the 24th century and their approach to crime and punishment based on the prison wear. Based on the prison wear. I don't, I don't know. It just kind of looks like a sort of gray utility jumpsuit. I guess he's out there doing some kind of like engineering work, manual engineering work, and it's sort of maybe a bit of a work suit. So whether that's what he wears all the time, I don't know. It could be that he has a different outfit when they're indoors or whatever. We don't really know, do we? Do we see any other instances of that particular penal colony in Star Trek? I don't know whether we do. In the original series, we did see prisoners. Yeah, but I don't know whether we see like the New Zealand penal colony, do we? No, I don't think so. Like in 30 days, why didn't they make Tom Paris bust out his old prison wear uniform? <laughs> I would have done that if I were if I were in charge of costuming. Replicate him a prison uniform, 30 days in the bridge. That's the bit that Ensign I was Paris. never quite sure about, whether or not it was actually a Starfleet facility he was at, or whether it was... Because he's not in Starfleet at that point, is he? Well, it's a Federation penal colony, I think they say, right? Yeah. That may not be Starfleet narrowly, it might be Federation in general. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really make sense for Starfleet to have their own, because usually if people end up in that situation, they'd be court-martialed anyway. Maybe Starfleet has their own, like, secret military prisons. Well, I mean, Section 31's got to have some kind of holding facility somewhere, haven't they? (laughs) They've got to have more than one. Yeah. And their outfits are different. Yes. I would have liked to have seen some Section 31 stuff in Voyager. That might have been quite cool. Like, you maybe could have combined it with the Omega Directive. Maybe this is a, a rewrite we could do. Like, the Omega Directive meets Section 31. Or the Voyager Conspiracy. Well, the Voyager Conspiracy is what I was thinking of, Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking maybe that would tie up with the Voyager conspiracy. This this sounds like a future episode of To the Journey for a rewrite. Seven's got to have information about Section 31 in her her Borg yeah. knowledge hanging around somewhere, surely. Because they, they must have assimilated a Section 31 operative at some point. Ooh, interesting. We'll put, we'll put a pin in that. Well, it's been fun talking about costumes and non-costumes today. But this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek.fm. Previously on Trek.fm, the ready room. How do they explain McCoy's beard and leisure suit and giant necklace in the motion picture when he first comes aboard the Enterprise? Is that a statement that he was making right there? It was. 
<laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> the statement is and what that, was that statement? The Larry? statement <laughs> is that in the future, even rural Georgia <laughs> can be just as disco as you damn well want to be. Saturday morning trek. I want to be on the couch of the kid in, in Maine, and his dad's a whaler. And he knows what Ambergris is, and he's watching it Saturday morning, and he turns on Star Trek, and he sees the Ambergris, and he's like, like, Dad, get in here. They're going whaling. (laughs) Meta Trex. But these Romulans are still walking around in those nasty pointy shoulder tunics that they wear. I mean, (laughs) what's up with that? (laughs) Doesn't seem like they shed as much of their identity as the Klingons Yeah, not shedding as much of their identity. Stage 9. A podcast about the people who make Star Trek. Like, I didn't want to come back to the show after that. Oh, my God. I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand. The world doesn't make any sense anymore, does it? Not at all. It makes less sense to me than it (laughs) did to Rekha Sharma's character at the end of Crossroads (laughs) Part (laughs) 2. And introducing our newest show, Primitive Culture. A look at history and culture through Star Trek. The key thing with Jutrelli is all of these elements are exactly the same thing as the events in real life. You know, the Metron Cascade is the bomb. Rhinax is Nagasaki or Hiroshima. You know, the poisoning is analogous to radiation poisoning and all these different things. And the, the parallels are enormously overt with Jutrell straight away. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is in the Babel Conference, our listeners-only discussion group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm contact. Just choose Send to a Show and select To the Journey. That'll come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Well, speaking of contact information, Suzanne, when you're not wandering around the corridors in your non-costume, where can people find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Uh, you can find me lurking around the Babel Conference. You can also find me on Twitter at kjaneway8. That's the letter K, Janeway, and the number 8. K, if someone would like to talk to you about ladies wearing white tuxedos, how can they contact you? Well, they can find me in the Babel Conference. And if they want to look me up on Twitter, my handle is Choco Weeble. Zach, when you're not raiding Jake Sisko's wardrobe, where can our listeners find you? <laughs> well, you can find me elsewhere on the Trek FM network as co-host of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy, along with my co-host over there, Mike Morrison. You can always find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. And you can find me in the Babel Conference if you want to talk about Star Trek or Voyager with me there. Well, we also have some people that we'd like to thank. We'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek FM, our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Shea Matala, our Patreon manager. We would also like to give a really big shout out to our three associate producers here on To The Journey, Bruce Lish, Ju Kim, and Richard Marquez. Thank you very much for your support of Trek FM. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, we'd like to invite you to become a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. 
available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Join us next week as we go in search of Neelix's apron and hat for Zachary's collection. Until then, this has been To The Journey.